I have seen engineering this week so hardcore that if I would show it to you on the video, my channel would get demonetized, okay? <laughs> For the most part of my entire life, I've been wondering about this one special question. What gear type is the most efficient one? Is it the spur gear? Is it the helical gear? Or is it a timing belt? And now I finally know the answer. And the answer is that it depends on the application and it depends on what you mean with being efficient. So that's it. <laughs> it's <laughs> If you clicked on this video to get the answer on this question, I'm going to disappoint you with this very engineering-like answer that it really depends. But what I can offer you is an insight into the discussion I am having with a lot of engineers right now around what gear types I should choose for certain application in my machine. So I'm trying to build a Marvel machine that can play music with marbles and I want to go on a world tour and this machine is human powered so we have a very scarce resource. Whatever power I'm able to put into the machine that's the only power input we have so it's really important that all the power transmission is efficient. So this is the drivetrain in an exploded view and I'm working here in the middle with a Hegen module that looks like a musical tank right now because of the two big flywheels. Okay, so the task is to take this shaft and gear it up to a high speed in an efficient way. And I've been looking at using standard metal gears like this and started with a spur gear for the low RPM high torque uh, application and then some double helical gears here. We need a lot of gearing up, a gear ratio of 1 to 50 kind of. That's pretty much. So then I started to look into instead using a timing belt and we can get the same gear ratio with only two stages. That's where we are today for our discussion. What power transmission type should I use to gear up this shaft 50 times down to this shaft? Turns out that's a highly nuanced question. There's no magic bullet answer to this question. I sent out a help request for choosing the best gear type and the responses were super interesting. 66% thought that some kind of helical gear is, is a great choice. The amazing community also helped me create this list with gear suppliers. We want to use standard parts so I found these standard gears but then there was another type of feedback that was really resonating with me. It's that these kinds of gears needs high precision. You really need the shafts to be in the correct distance between each other and completely parallel and the tooth interaction especially with helical gears needs to be perfect to achieve those high 98-99% efficiency numbers. So a lot of people gave me the feedback it's not gears you want to use it's timing belts and pulleys you want to use. One of the key aspects is that the alignment between the pulleys can be way less precise compared uh, to uh, a couple of big metal helical gears. But with timing belts you have a couple of different challenges. For example, what I'm missing here are some idlers, the belt tensioners that can increase the wrap angle. So the wrap angle is how many degrees the belt is hugging the gear. So we want a big wrap angle for an efficient power transmission. So a couple of idlers will be needed uh, here in this solution. Another option is to buy a gearbox from gearbox suppliers, which they are a ton. This company is famous harmonic drive for their harmonic drives, but they also make planetary gearboxes. So this looks like a magic bullet, uh, and this is beautifully engineered and it's a solution off the shelf. I can just put one part on the machine and be done with it. This is really interesting. However, most of these options are used to gear something down. Like a high speed motor is the input shaft and you get a slower output. And I want to gear something up. And currently I'm not aware of the efficiencies of these gearboxes when you back drive them. So would a small really compact planetary gearbox off the shelf part uh, be a perfect solution? Maybe. Also, maybe not. Uh, there are nuances to all these questions and that's the theme of this video. For example, the axis is up here. I really want to transfer the power down to this empty area down here. And when we add the flywheels, we want to keep the center of the flywheel as low as possible for the center of gravity being low close to the floor. And if we put a planetary gearbox on this shaft, this flywheel will be two meters up in the air. 
So the fact that the timing belts allow us to change the position of the axle is actually a big plus uh, with the timing belt. So with the timing belt, we can move the flywheel all the way down here and we get rid of a lot of material in the frame and stuff. And so when you look at a single part of the machine, you also have to zoom out and look at the whole system holistically to really inform your design decisions. I've made a new help request where I want your feedback on the gearbox design, uh, this craziness right here. If you want to help out with the Mar Machine project, you can go to the engineering server and you can go to help requests. And here at help requests, you can see the results of previous help requests, but you can also see the open current help requests. And right now we have only two help requests open. I want to show you the music gearbox one. The discussion is how should we design this music gearbox module in the middle here? And I have done a huge write up with all the design requirements and I'm proposing two suggestions. We have these suggestions with all the gears on the shafts and we are achieving some design requirements with a lot of uh, music tempos here. So here's all the BPMs we can play with that design. But then I had some feedback from Discord already to simplify and just use two pair of gears that you remove between each song. So that's the uh, second suggestion. So to really be able to help me with a nuanced question like design issues like this, read everything I write before I start to think about your solution because I actually spend efforts trying to convey the nuances of, of this problem. And then you can choose what design you prefer and if you like timing belts or if you like chain and sprockets. But this kind of feedback is very low resolution. So if you want to give me more in-depth feedback, I have a way that you can do that. And I'm accepting feedback only in image format uploaded to a Dropbox file request. And I will post the best and most interesting submissions to the Music Gearbox Discord channel. So yeah, looking so much forward to your feedback on this. One suggestion that is super popular is to use a CVT kind of gearbox. That means continuous variable transmission. And Nick here found one that claims to have a constant output. And this is interesting. So there's a lot of nuance here. And the main design requirement for the mom machine is to play tight music. Normal CVTs, as far as I have understood them, don't have a perfect constant RPM output. A lot of very experienced high-skilled engineers that I respect a lot have given me the advice to stay very far away from CVT transmission gearboxes. And I know this is a super popular subject to argue about, so let's try to stay friendly <laughs> when we discuss CVTs. But if someone has actual sources, not just opinions, this would be really helpful to find out if a CVT can have a perfect RPM output. Okay, another thing that I would love your help with is to find some nice flywheels. When I was building a custom flywheel in Germany, a lot of people say, come on Martin, you should just use a standard flywheel off the shelf. However, car flywheels are very readily available. They're too small. I want a much larger outer diameter flywheel, almost up to a meter in diameter, because OD, a big outer diameter, is king when it comes to moment of inertia. So the car flywheels are not interesting in this case. So if you are among those who told me to use a standard flywheel when I was doing the custom one in Germany, I'm very happy to get your help. So you can go here and go to finding flywheel suppliers and you can fill in the name of the suppliers. I only had four responses on this help request, so perhaps it's true that it's kind of hard to find off-the-shelf big flywheels. Okay, let's talk some cool engineering. I have seen engineering this week so hardcore that if I would show it to you on the video, my channel would get demonetized, <laughs> okay? Let me show you two really cool things that has happened the last two weeks. This is the Higgins drive and all the physics of the Mar machine starts with this shaft. And I've long wondered what kind of sprocket I should use here. And I had a meeting with SKF's power transmission team and they looked at this application and recommended this product. These are duplex sprockets which feels really nice for this application. This is the duplex chain that the power transmission team from SKF recommended. By the way it was super fun having this meeting with the power transmission team like with this 
a lot of hardcore international engineers knowing their stuff. And I felt like I am slowly able to talk to talk a little bit. They were throwing Newton meters around in the room and I was like kind of following. <laughs> so so that is really fun. I've come a far away from like doing plywood gears on a bandsaw. I'm, I'm, I, I really have. But the key is that we can understand all this with physics calculations. And on Discord, I have a whole physics calculations team now that have been wonderful to discuss with. And they have suggested something quite mind-blowing. If you're going through any kind of design process, uh, this following point is actually super, super interesting. So the user HelloLarinerd in the physics calculations channel wrote this. The most important thing we can aid Martin in doing is reducing his time per iteration. I think getting into the CAD package too early can waste valuable time that could be used creating simpler models that get greater detail over time. So what does this mean? On the first Mar machine, I iterated in the physical world. I made some plywood pieces on the bandsaw, I put them onto the machine and checked if it worked or not. If it didn't work, I made new pieces. This was a really slow, long process. So on the MMX, I was iterating in 3D design files in the computer, and I was also iterating a little bit in the physical world. This was also a very slow process, and both of my earlier machines failed. What Halola Renard is suggesting is that we are going to iterate in a theoretical realm. We can iterate on a 2D paper with pen and paper. And this is an example that Egresino made of a 2D systems model, which is a mathematical way to visualize a physical system. So here's the Hugen Ratchet that we discussed the sprockets for earlier in the video. The idea is that put your design requirements down on pen and paper and check if you can achieve those design requirements on pen and paper. This is brain blowing up emoji time, okay? And the more I'm trying to learn this, the more I realize that if we do not have the design requirements written down, we have nothing to discuss with each other. <laughs> Several times during these weeks talking with engineers on Discord, I hit this wall in the communication where like, where I realize in my brain, oh, if I haven't stated the design requirement, there's absolutely nothing for us to discuss. Everything else is just conjecture and basically a waste of time. This is a big unlock happening in my brain right now. When I went to SKF and met with Roger, Roger went to this 2D realm immediately. Like that's where Roger wanted to discuss a choice of a bearing. Well, I think me doing CAD models and showing you my idea is really helpful for me communicating to the engineers what I'm trying to do. But then we should iterate as much as possible in spreadsheets and in 2D diagrams. It's taking me surprisingly long to get to this point where I truly, truly, truly start to understand that it's the design requirements that will design the machine. <laughs> It sounds obvious now when I say it, but old habits die hard. I'm like, I want to try if this, uh, I want to see with my own hands. I want to feel with my own hands. And I'm just not used to working so much in theory. So here's another description of, of some marble machine shafts. And I totally no, don't understand anything in this image. <laughs> But what I do understand is to strive to reduce iteration time and work more efficiently and build your design on a solid theoretical base. Two main takeaways from today's video. One, we need the design requirements, otherwise we have nothing to discuss. Two, choosing the components to fulfill the design requirements is a very nuanced task and discussion. There are no clear answers except the laws of physics. That's basically what we can hold on to in this wild, stormy design sea. See you next week. Ciao.